Uh, well, welcome. My name is Carl Blythe. I'm the director of CORAL. That's how we pronounce it. It stands for the Center for Open Educational Resources and Language Learning. And we're coming here today uh, to you from the University of Texas at Austin, Austin, Texas. Um, we have a little bit of uh, coordination here. It's a little little logistical nightmares, but I think we're OK with things now. We have, we're coming to you on the internet with Adobe Connect. Um, and we want this to be interactive, so we have a chat room function on Adobe Connect. So all of, all of those people who are joining us virtually, uh, you can join the discussion. We have somebody monitoring the discussion, and she will be telling me what's going on uh, in, in the chat room. Um, so the place to begin, of course, is this is a symposium. And a symposium typically means, if you look it up in a dictionary, it means then a discussion of a single topic. And our topic here today is open education. And it typically includes many different speakers. And all of you, I hope, will participate. We want to emphasize the notion of participation. This is about participatory culture, a culture of participation. So there are invited speakers, but I really expect all of you to take part. And we're going to make sure you take part by having activities and panels, and it will be highly interactive. And of course, we have then the virtual audience and the, the audience here in Austin. But um, the word uh, symposium, uh, the etymology is interesting. It's from the Greek. And it actually originally meant um, a drinking party. Um, so we want to uh, kind of combine these two ideas of a convivial atmosphere where there's lots of food. Unfortunately, those of you uh, in the virtual environment don't know, but we have a lot of food in the back. Um, so it's a gathering to discuss an intellectual topic. And it should be informal. It should be convivial. And we should have a good intellectual conversation. So the agenda for today, um, actually, we, we've broken the symposium. It'll go over two days. But today's, uh, we have two sessions. And the first session, uh, we're calling Defining Open Education. That's the morning session, because that's the place to begin. We come from different parts of this knowledge ecology. And not all of you know exactly what we mean when we use the term OER. So the place to begin is really uh, defining uh, the basics of open education. The next session in the afternoon will then be uh, bringing open education into the foreign language classroom. So there we'll, we'll start to talk about the more the practical realities of how do you do this, talk about how do you find uh, OERs, because they're out there, but people t tell us they don't know how to find them. And then we'll talk to teachers about the impact. What, it's, what is it like to teach with these online materials and mix them maybe with commercial materials or go completely on, uh, on using OERs? And then uh, the next, uh, the second day, uh, our session, the last session, is called Bringing Open Education into the Foreign Language Profession. And um, there we're going to be talking about how do we create OERs for the profession to make them even more shareable than they already are. And finally, we have the grand finale. We have a couple of surprises for you. Um, and that is about professional development as an open foreign language educator. How do you become an open foreign language educator? You may not identify yourself as one right now, but hopefully by the end of this symposium, you may have a taste of what that means. And we have uh, a way to keep the symposium going. We have something called badges, professional certification for people who are interested in that. And that's where we will, will end up, is of course, with the future. So um, before I begin today's presentation, uh, let me, here's our morning agenda, where I'm going to tell you briefly about CORAL, what we are and what we do. And then we'll talk about, uh, as I said, defining open education and, and the impact on foreign language learning. And then you will envision the future together okay, with an activity. And then we'll, hung, we'll be hungry, and even more food will show up. So how do you say our name? Well, you can pronounce it like this, like a coral reef. That's actually what I intended when I was kind of playing around with the ac this unpronounceable acronym. But it's really interesting to me because people pronounce it like this. Curl, and that's OK. That's fine. I know what you're talking about. 
I heard somebody actually, this is true, Corel, and I was looking through for the Corel. Do you know what this is, right? So dinnerware, this is actually a company called Corel. And we're in Texas after all, so Corel. Um, these, all these pictures, by the way, are open photographs from the internet, right? So we're going to try to practice what we preach by openness and the practices surrounding openness. So the point is, of course, we don't care how you pronounce our acronym. It doesn't really matter, but the important part is the OER, which is at the center of our acronym, Center for Open Educational Resources and Language Learning. Um, so about CORAL. Well, we are a uh, National Foreign Language Resource Center, and there are 15 of us throughout the country, from the East Coast to the West Coast, and even including Hawaii. Hawaii is one of the first. Uh, it was started in, in 1990 by the U.S. government. Uh, and so we're the, the newest, the new kid on the block. We're only two years old. Uh, we are headquartered here at the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, we were formerly, many of the, of the staff, many of us were originally in an entity, a center called Texas Language Technology Center. And the shift from TLTC to CORAL is important because we were basically people interested in educational technology serving the needs of our institution. Now, of course, since we're federally funded, we want to serve the needs of the country. And even since we're putting it online, it's global education. And of course, we're focused on open education, and that makes a big difference. So the mission of all of the national foreign language resource centers, we all have the same mission, and that, of course, is to improve the teaching and learning of foreign languages in this country. And we do that by, uh, in many different ways. We, of course, produce materials. We put on workshops to train teachers. We develop assessments, different ways to assess proficiency. Um, we also, very importantly, make materials for less commonly taught languages, or LICTLs, another acronym. Um, so we all have the same mission. Uh, but we do have different personalities. The LRCs have slightly different personalities. And as I mentioned, we're focused, our mission then to improve foreign languages, well, we do that through the publication of OER, so Open Educational Resources. And that's a grab bag. That means many different things. That's uh, uh, reference grammars, corpora, assessment tools, et cetera. It's not just courses or textbooks. It's many different things. OK, so that's who we are. Now let's start talking about open education. Um, what we mean, and we, of course, is here at Coral, but more generally what I think open educators mean by the term open education um, has been nicely summarized by a little short video that I want to sh uh, show you. And the video was actually the, 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 the winner, the grand prize winner of a competition that was just uh, announced in, in spring. And this was a collaborative effort, we're going to be talking a lot about collaboration, between the Department of Education, Creative Commons, which is a, a nonprofit organization, a legal organization, to come up with alternatives to the copyright system, to the copyright laws, and something called the Open Society Foundations. Uh, this is not just about education. This is about making all societies more open, including economies and political structures and so forth. So this is an interesting group already of collaborators. It is international. It's not just the, you know, you, the Department of, of Education, the US Department of Education. So they were trying to. Uh, see if we could crystallize it in a short two-minute video what open ed education is all about. And of course, the winner comes to us from South Africa. Education is vital. It enriches our lives, sustains our communities, and helps us grow into the future. At least, that's the idea. Truth is, education as we know it is failing millions around the world. Take Tando, for example. He's a bright kid with big dreams, but the education he's getting is holding him back. You see, Tando's school can't afford the latest learning materials, so he has to work with textbooks that are completely outdated. To make matters worse, Tando's teacher is also left using outdated information 
often without even realizing it. And even if he manages to overcome this and gets into college, the cost of all the lessons, books, and notes he needs will land Tundo in a pile of debt. It's not just Tundo. This situation is being replayed in schools and colleges all around the world. So much for education for all. So how can we fix things? The answer lies in open education. Open Education is a global movement that aims to bring quality education to teachers and students everywhere. The basic idea is to put top-notch learning materials on the web that anyone can access for free. You see, unlike textbooks, Open Ed resources can always be revised, so they're never out of date. Teachers are given free license to adapt them and improve them, giving students exactly what they need to achieve their dreams. As all open ed resources are free to share, schools are no longer limited by where they are or how much money they have. And if you think open education doesn't make the grade, think again. Open ed resources are being created by the world's most respected institutions and scholars. And the Obama administration is set to invest up to $2 billion in open ed in the next four years alone from the highest branches of government right down to grassroots level. Open education is changing lives. Visit creativecommons.org forward slash education to learn more. Okay, so this is a clever little promotional video for the notion of open education. It's an advertisement essentially. And they were very smart politically. You know, they thought this is a put on by the Department of uh, Education, so they give a shout out to the Obama administration, and also to Creative Commons, who was promoting this. But essentially, the way it's constructed is we have a problem, and we're going to solve it with open educational practices. So real quickly, what were some of the problems that you picked up on? Tell me. Outdated materials. OK, so analog materials are quickly outdated. It takes a long time to get a textbook to market and in technical fields as rocket science. That was, I guess that teacher was doing rocket science. Uh, yeah, they're outdated right away. What else? Cost. Number one, when people talk about open education, they associate that with the rising costs of textbooks. Surveys show that in most colleges now in the United States, it's $800 to $1,000 on textbooks a year, um, which is having a huge impact, particularly on minority uh, populations. People who are, for, are maybe the first time they've gone to college, they don't have a like, college legacy in their family, it's sticker shock. It's keeping people out of the education marketplace. What else? What other problems does it seek to solve? Yeah, remote locations, the um, access. They're, they don't have access for a lot of different reasons. What else? Anything else you picked up on? Those are the big ones. So much for, and right in the middle of the promo, it says, so much for education for all. So the presupposition is education should be for everybody, and there are all kinds of barriers to, to that. We want, as open educators, to open up the riches of our institutions and spread them around. So it is kind of an altruistic, value-laden mission. Um, so that's what we mean by open education. Here's a nice little definition that comes from where else, but Wikipedia. A collective term that refers to forms of education in which knowledge, ideas, or important aspects of me teaching methodology or infrastructure are shared freely over the internet. So it's not just about materials. We're talking more generally about the creation of knowledge and the dissemination of knowledge. I like this quote. It comes from Rich Baranek. Rich is a professor of uh, computer science and electrical engineering at Rice University, just down the road here from Austin uh, in Houston. And Rich is also the founder of creations.org, one of the largest uh, sites on the internet, places to go on the internet for open content, open educational content. It's essentially an archive. And he writes, open the open education movement is based on a set of intuitions shared by a remarkably wide range of academics, that knowledge should be free and open to use and reuse, that collaboration should be easier, not harder, that people should receive credit and kudos for contributing to education and research, 
and that concepts and ideas are linked in unusual and surprising ways and not the simple linear forms that today's textbook present. So he adds the notion of this is a movement. There are lots of people kind of joining this movement. But notably, he, uh, I think, emphasizes that it, this is kind of an ideology or a value system. We believe that it should be more open. We believe that people should get credit. So there, again, this is kind of a presupposition that what we have right now is not as open as it should be, um, that people are working hard but not getting the credit that they deserve, that they should get, and so forth. Um, so what we mean here at Coral by OER, well, we're talking, OER means any educational material offered freely for anyone to use, typically, and this is important, involving some permission to remix, improve, and redistribute. Okay, that's not every, that doesn't mean just all online materials, right? So uh, we, we need to think about what open means. So uh, there are a lot of free access materials, lots of stuff on the internet that you can use. That is, they're online and they don't have a password and they don't have a fee. That's terrific. But when we talk about OERs, we really mean the four R's. And this is an idea from David Wiley, who is an educational technologist at Brigham Young. And he says, reuse, that's the right to copy something verbatim. So everybody's Xeroxes, textbooks, you have something you want to bring to your class, you put it on the, text, on the Xerox machine, you make 30 copies and you pass them out, and you've just violated copyright. You're not supposed to do that. Um, but with open materials, you have the permission to do that copy verbatim. Redistribute. Well, you made 30 copies because you plan not just making a copy for yourself, but giving them out to your students. It's really easy in the digital world to send something out, right? You post it, you post it to Facebook, and suddenly all of your Facebook followers have that PDF that you have, right? Um, now, a step further, of course, is revising, because you may want to go in a PDF you can't revise, but if you put it up in an editable, for editable form, then your students can actually have access to that, that material and, and, and edit it. And then one step even further is remixing. So you want to take that essay or that activity and combine it with somebody else's. So that's what we mean by OER. Um, when we talk about OER, uh, we, uh, in the promo you heard it's free, it's free. Um, the, in the open source movement, which happened 20 years ago when the internet started, people designers, web, web designers were saying, coders were saying, we should have the code. We want to join in and develop the code along with everybody else. Um, so when we say free, there's a saying in the open source movement, free not as in free beer, but free as in free speech. So, but there are two meanings of open here. It does mean it's free for end users, that is they don't pay for it all, uh, but it, it's, it's not free for the, us who develop the materials, obviously. But it's free as in it's your right. You should share it. So another way of conceptualizing open is to think about it not in, in a, this binary distinction. You either are closed or you're open, but you're on a continuum. And this is also an idea that's been promoted by David Wiley. So note that I attribute ideas to people. That's very important. Um, he talks about this continuum of openness. So there are traditional materials, analog print materials, that are closed because they have the C. That doesn't, doesn't stand for closed. That stands for copyright. Right? So copyright means all rights reserved. You've seen that. That's closed. That's what all rights reserved means. OERs, if I, as I just told you, says, well, you know, I'll give you some of these rights. And they are reuse, redistribute, revise, remix. You can play the game with me. In fact, I can even continue on the open continuum, and there's something called public domain. Do what you want to with this, I don't care. Okay, so there are uh, materials online or images, I use some of those. You don't even have to attribute this, I don't care, just use it. You can conceptualize teaching practices or classrooms as more or less open. Uh, the traditional classroom is tethered, I like that word, I read that somewhere, tethered to the real world. Uh, and we think of students as Enrolled. They better be enrolled in my class, otherwise we kick them out, right? <laughs> it would be very strange if a student wanders in or a group of students wander into my class after two weeks and just sit down on the front row. 
Um, but there are lots of blended spaces, cyber spaces, where people are enrolled, but there are also portions of their courses which are public, right? And then all the way to totally open courses uh, that are open just for the public in general. Um, we can conceptualize research as more or less open. Uh, so the traditional forms of research are, of course, uh, the researcher in humanities, it's typically one person, right? Uh, writing a book, doing the research by him or herself. Um, in sciences, typically we have then teams of researchers working together who may or may not be collaborating with other research teams in other locations. So it grows, it becomes more open in that way. But typically, traditional research, we as researchers know the, the, the the methods and our data, and we don't share them freely. But there are more and more, there are attempts at opening things up to share with the public or interested parties our methods and our data, so we're including them in the actual research process. So it's not just only conducting research, it's also disseminating research. We can conceptualize it in terms of open and closed. I've given you the examples of two journals, Foreign Language Annals, since I'm talking to teaching uh, foreign language teachers, um, that's a print journal, and you have access to that if you join Actual. It's part of your membership fee. So you, there are subscribed readers. Or you can uh, uh, access it by going to a library. As opposed to LLT, Language Learning and Technology, which is um, uh, it's a totally open site uh, in, the sense, in the sense that there's no password and there are no keys. OK, another way of thinking about OER, big and little. And of course, there's a continuum there as well. Um, big OERs, some of you know Francie Antakif will be talking about Accesso. We'll be talking about different o OERs produced by some of our panelists. These are generated by institutions, big institutions, like the University of Texas at Austin, or Carnegie Mellon, um, or MIT Courseware, or the UK's Open University. There are lots of advantages, obviously. They have the reputation of a large institution. Um, typically, they're of high quality. You don't need to really repurpose it. It comes in a box. It's look, it looks like a textbook. Um, and they're pretty easy to locate, because you know that the University of Texas has a big presence on the web. The disadvantages, of course, they're expensive to make. And they're not often, they're not native to the web. And by this, I mean that they look like a textbook, and the conceptualization of a textbook originated before the web. So they still, they're maybe being ported to the web, but they're not originating somehow in the web thought. And their reuse of those four R's, they're kind of limited. We say we want to do all those things and promote sharing, but it still is somewhat limited. On the other end of the spectrum, there are lots of people, individuals, producing lots of really cool things. Uh, and they're, they're native to the web because they're using uh, all kinds of technologies that have, are native. They're easy to remix. The disadvantages, of course, they may be not the greatest quality. You're not able to discern the reputation. They're hard to locate because Fred has come up with this great new tool for morphology or this lesson on preterite and imperfect. But you can't, but who's going to find Fred's homepage, right? Um, so the examples, blog posts and podcasts, things like that. So we'll be talking about the spectrum and how to move back and forth between the, the, the two. So another way of thinking about OERs is to talk about it in terms of enablers. Uh, by the way, the term OER was coined in 2002 at a UNESCO meeting. Because it, it dawned on people that, you know, we've really entered a, a, a new age. We're creating knowledge in a different way. We should have materials that are more dynamic and that support this new kind of knowledge creation. And so part of this uh, ecology is open licenses, Creative Commons, open standards. I'll be telling you what, a little bit about what that means, a general way of talking among a group. The technology itself, different kinds of technology that supports sharing and communities of practice. That's a very important part. So open licenses. As I mentioned, Creative Commons, that's the CC. It's a, um, when we talk about copyright, Creative Commons is really copy left. Uh, so instead of saying all rights reserved, some rights reserved. You can play the game with me. And however, all open, licenses 
uh, from Creative Commons means attribution. That's why it's bold-faced here. In other words, whatever you do, you must give credit to the educator for whatever, or the researcher, or whatever. Right? Now, you can also think, talk about it in terms of derivatives. Should I allow this person to make a derivative work from my work? Maybe. That's up to you to decide as the author. Should I let this person um, make a profit? I'm not making a profit off my materials, but if you want to, hey, go ahead. Um, some people say, no, I, I'm a nonprofit. You should be a nonprofit. And then the share alike. This is, we can specify how we want you to share these materials. So again, open licenses themselves are on a degree of for this continuum. So and the, uh, in, uh, the most closed open license, if that makes any sense. Right, these are all CC licenses. Uh, you see the CC in the circle. It's a Creative Commons, and it says buy. So that means attribution. You have to use this and then attribute it who you're using it, who, who, who developed it. It says in fee, which means non-commercial. You may not use this textbook or this, this OER for your, uh, your profit. And ND, no derivatives. So no remixing. On the other hand, if uh, the, the most open license of all, and there, I believe there are six licenses right now in, in Creative Commons, look, just attribute it to us, but do what you want. Okay, most open. Standards. Um, now, uh, Actful, of course, has this notion of proficiency guidelines. Those circles over there interconnecting, or you might recognize them, those are the national standards. Um, we have the Common European Framework. These are ways of talking about a field that we somehow share. Okay, and if we were to adopt then then build materials that are are that that adopt these standards, then people kind of know what we're talking about. A good example. Uh, we also have sta uh, uh, state standards here in the United States. So different states have different curricular standards. A good example of this of taking standards. Um, is LARC. I have a shout out to my friends at LARC. It's the uh, uh, Language Acquisition Research Center, Resource Center in San Diego State. And uh, they've come up with this really cool little OER. It's more on the little side of the spectrum. It's called a uh, lesson plan generator. And because there are people in California, they have their own standards, so they're generating lessons that then meet the California standards. Okay. So technology is pretty obvious. They're all, all technology right now. Social media is booming, and it's all about sharing. Uh, so you found an article today in the New York Times. You want to share it with your people, and you just click on Facebook, and boom, you send it out to everyone, or you post it to Facebook, or you send it to your Twitter account. So here at Coral, we've been thinking about how to make things more shareable. And we have a discussion, and I hope that we'll have more discussions, about how to modularize content. Um, for example, French Interactive, people use this in all kinds of ways. And they don't want to adopt the whole thing. If they just want to use our videos, they can just download the videos, and that's fine. We talked about embeddable media. So if we have a video and they don't want that video, they can switch it out, embed something else. Uh, editable formats. Uh, PDFs, if you make a document in a PDF, that's not editable. But if you have Google Docs, for example, then lots of people can change it. Um, we've also talked about multiple formats because surveys show that uh, students and teachers don't want just a textbook anymore. They want it available in lots of different options. And by the way, they don't want just, just electronic versions. They want the print version, too. They want it all. Importantly, um, all of this is happening in communities of practice because where people really share, of course, are with others, and that happens in, in communities. So um, we have different communities represented here. We have teacher organizations, AATF, American Association of Teachers of French. Um, we have uh, professional organizations like Calico, so instructional technologists that talk to each other. We have Drupal. Drupal is an open course management software. So software developers, who and we're building things in Drupal so that we can give it to other institutions. And if they have Drupal software developers, they can extend it and play with it and drive it in new directions. 
We have archivists, Merlot and OER Commons are large archives but it, that have lots of content, but importantly, they have editorial teams. They have people who are working to curate the, that content. And then there are, other, there, there are more and more. We have people like Live Mocha, which is a commercial enterprise, but they're trying to open up. They're trying to see, they're, they're, they're trying to experiment with, uh, with open practices. So let me talk to you uh, a little bit about some of the initiatives that are represented by some of the people here today that I've invited to talk to us. And they are themselves somewhat on a continuum of openness. And I think I want to make that point clear. Yes, we are here to promote open education, but this is really evolving quickly. It's a moving target. And people um, have the right to choose what level their, com what their comfort level, where they are on the spectrum. So Fernando Rubio at the University of Utah has developed, a, a Spanish professor at, at Utah, has developed a terrific on a hybrid course. And uh, this is not open. It's password protected, right? As he would admit himself, right? He's right here in the audience. Um, but interestingly, it is half based on a commercial product, uh, Nexos. And that is by Heinle, or what's the? Cengage. Okay. But he has developed, he said, but 50% of the course, it's a hybrid course. So he's trying to do half of it online, half in the classroom. So he's actually developed half the course with his developmental team. And um, so that's kind of interesting. Oh, what you see are people more and more developing their own materials, or at least people extending a commercial product, right? So. That's one example of a hybrid course that's not really, wouldn't meet the criteria of perhaps online. Maybe we can talk about what would it get, what can we do to make Fernando make this an online course? Or maybe we can't because there are institutional barriers at, at Utah for that. Um, moving on the continuum, we have Carnegie Mellon's uh, open learning initiative. Um, Carnegie Mellon is one of the big players. When people talk about open education, they always cite MIT and Carnegie Mellon was right up at the top of the list. And it's because of this OLI. These are entire courses that are available. They're open access courses, uh, primarily in the sciences uh, and technology, so physics and statistics, courses like that. You can take them for free. You can, you can just take the course because it's open. Or you can sign up for credit. But again, it doesn't play the game of the four R's. You're not allowed to take it and revise their course. No, it wasn't conceived in that way. It's also, I think, important because they have invested heavily in something called learner analytics. So as people use, go through a course, it's also, uh, it's a research project. It, it takes information about how people learn using these materials. Um, maybe moving farther along the continuum, Accesso. And um, I forgot to mention Chris Jones. We have Chris here. Uh, uh, is the French developer for the online course at Carnegie Mellon with a team of people there. Uh, at, from the University of Kansas, we have a, a course called Accesso. And it was actually Fernando who told me about Accesso uh, this was about a year ago. I went online and looked at it and thought, wow, this is terrific. Um, again, it's a collaborative effort. There are many people who've developed it, but we have with us today uh, Amy Rosamondo and Jonathan Perkins. Amy, uh, then. Kind of inter it's interesting as a collaborative effort between technology, a technologist, and a content provider. So Amy, a Spanish professor. Jonathan is the director of their language center. So we'll talk about, about how they created it collaboratively. But again, we see here they have a Creative Commons license. Yay. But they also say, no, we don't. We don't want you to make derivative works. We want you to use this. And that's fine. They have the prerogative to do that. But in talking, reading Amy has published on Access, so she's talking very much like an open educator. She wants to inspire others to create modules that look like Access. So again, it's an intermediate Spanish uh, program. Um, and then we've been at this game for a long time, so I would say we're more open according to the criteria that we gave you. We have a the Francais Interactif here at UT. Uh, we have, and I have George Dediveau's name here because he's going to be talking. He's not a developer, but in a way he is. He's teaching with it and really extending it 
in ways that the developers hadn't envisioned. Um, and he can do that because we have a CC license that's completely open. Just give us credit for some of this. We started it, but you take it in whatever direction you want. So I'm going to quickly go through a couple of other slides here to show you that uh, uh, open is not just for foreign language teaching and, and, and textbooks, but it can touch on many different areas. Here at Coral, we're producing lots of open materials for lictals, as I said, so less commonly taught. We just finished last year Yoruba textbook. This is important because, of course, with the financial crisis that's hitting higher education, publishing companies really can't take this on. They don't make any money publishing lictal materials. So that's part of our mission is to, to, is, is to partner with, with professors in these areas, content developers, and, and develop a good lictal materials. Um, this is a really interesting uh, website project. This uh, Open Spanish Corpus, I talked about a corpora being tools, too, for teaching. Um, and we have Jacqueline Toribio. Jacqueline, okay. So Jacqueline is our project director. She is a linguist in the Department of Spanish and Portuguese here. And one of two uh, project directors, Barbara Bullock, also a linguist in the French department. French and Italian is partnering with her to produce this. And the idea here is to go out uh, around the state of Texas and just in, in, and conduct sociolinguistic interviews. These interviews, of course, are videotaped and transcribed by the end of the summer. So we're, we're August 9th. Hopefully by the end of August, we will have 100, this is our goal, 100 videotaped interviews all transcribed and the transcriptions all synced to the interviews. That's already huge, right? So you'll be able to click on a word, and it takes you right to that part, part in the interview. They have a sociolinguistic goal, which is to uh, document the linguistic landscape of, of Texas, here, uh, of Spanish here in Texas. But we hope we hope to um, also then use this corpus as a place for teachers to develop authentic materials or materials around materials around authentic uh, Spanish as it's spoken here in Texas. Real quickly, open source tools. It's not for any particular language. These are This is an annotation tool that we're working on, eComma. You can have a classroom all together annotating a text. Why would you want to do that? Well, for all kinds of different reasons, for reading through a text or if you want to focus them on particular forms. Um, there are lots of different uses for annotation. And also, um, as I mentioned, this is, is being done in Drupal, which is an open, open source. So when we launch it, hopefully uh, in January, some January, February, um, people can then continue to develop it. So we have, uh, there are just a couple other projects, Gateway to Chinese, Conversa Brasileira, Aswat Arabia. I just invite you to take a look at our website for lots of the materials that we're developing. OK, so why do all this work? Because it is work. Why, uh, why spend your time making materials and then just giving them away? Well, we do believe that there are true benefits to the learner. Uh, obviously, m many of those things were cited in, in the video, that promotional video that you watched. So they lower the cost. Um, most of our materials are available either for free or for a nominal fee. The materials, as we said, can be localized to classrooms, and that really changes things. Because textbooks, by their nature, have to be generic because they want the biggest market share. But everybody adapts textbooks. Everybody does this. We're trying to then design materials to make that, uh, that localization easier. Um, community involvement leads to quality control. That's the idea behind Wikipedia. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't always work as well. But the idea is really, um, I think, um, captured by, the, no, by the, the word in reach, which is a word I heard Rick Berenick, Rich Berenick use uh, this year. So we talk about outreach. Part of CORAL is to conduct outreach. That's what we're doing right now, to explain ourselves and our practices to a community. But once we give materials away that are editable, people have in reach. The materials come back to us in forms that we hadn't imagined practices that we hadn't imagined, and they're better than what we had imagined. So that's the idea of in-reach. And learners, of course, can become part of the creation process. They have a different sense of ownership. Learners often, as we will see, become teachers. Benefits to educators, and there are a lot. 
Um, we believe, we truly believe that your materials will have a greater impact if you open them up. Um, you can reach more people. We have millions of people using our, 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 our statistics kind of boggle our minds. And you can actually gain recognition. Here in, uh, in, in a university atmosphere, the question of tenure, do you get tenure based on open materials? That's a big question. It's hotly debated. Um, but we do know it has great impact. Um, you have more control over your own materials. Um, program fees from print-on-demand help with sustainability. Sustainability is obviously, a, it, that's probably not just for educators, that's for administrators because here at Coral, uh, as we're fighting budget cuts, we need to think about sustainability. And first and finally, uh, I've mentioned um, high quality materials for less commonly taught languages. But really I think the big deal for me has been creating a community of practice with other colleagues around materials. So what are the challenges? Well, there are many. Um, it takes a lot of work. Teachers tell us all the time, you know, I like this idea, but to select and to sequence, shouldn't somebody else be doing that job for me? Should that be my job? That's, that's a lot of work. I don't want to do it, okay? Um, that's true, but there are benefits to actually taking things apart and thinking about it. But of course, not all teachers have that time. Educators, of course, we found out need training and support and seminars such as this to help them understand how to put things together and that's what we're going to teach you this the next day and a half. There's a lot of skepticism about the quality of OERs. They're still not on par with commercial materials. Right? Um, and finally, uh, and, and the last two points, um, I, I go around and give talks and I ask teacher groups, so who's heard of OER or open education? And in a group of 30, I might have a, one hand or two hands. So we still have a lot of education to do. And of course, the issues of sustainability, again, I said these are free for you to use. They're not free for us to make. So I want to end with this idea. And this is from uh, uh, Clay Shirky, who uh, published this book in 2010 called Cognitive Surplus coined this term. Uh, Clay Shirky is a professor at NYU of New Media Studies. And his notion of, of cognitive surplus is captured, of course, in, in this little graphic here of a crowd coming together, a group of people coming together in an additive way to create something that they hadn't been able to do as individuals coming together uh, in, a, in a way that adds up for society. So the subtitle is How Technology Makes Consumers, Passive Consumers, into Collaborators. So when uh, Clay wrote this book, and um, you can imagine people started really discussing it. It was a very provocative idea. And this is a great example of extending an idea. Many people started visualizing Clay's ideas. One of the uh, examples he gives in his book is this big square here, you see, and you see the tiny little square down there? So he gives lots of facts and figures about leisure time activities and different kinds of things that people are involved in. 200 billion hours a year spent watching television by, the American, by American adults. 200 billion. That's a lot of time, a lot of free time. So he kind of talks about, he's not bashing television watching, by the way. He's into all kinds of media. Um, but of course, people have talked about television as being rel relatively passive. We sit in front of a television and we receive content. We can't change the content. We just receive the content. Okay. That little tiny block down there is, means 100 million hours of people, uh, 100 million hours uh, to create Wikipedia. So all the people who've given their time to create Wikipedia. It's tiny, it's a fraction. Now here's the interesting thing he points out. Um, television watching has been going up ever since television was invented. It's been going up and up and up and up and up and up, and except recently it's been going down. Why would that be? Maybe because there's no good content, right? I have direct TV, I have hundreds of channels, and it's all junk. Um, some of it's okay, but it's not, it's not that really. He says the people are migrating from television to the internet. They're doing more and more things. Now it may be you can actually watch television on the internet. You can do that. 
Um, but they're going to the internet and that makes a huge difference because again, the content that's coming to you, sometimes it is editable so you can change it. And then importantly, you can share it and it comes back to you. Now, um, this is what he means by cognitive surplus. We've got a lot of time on our hands and a lot of brain power on our hands. And I want to talk to you then, personalize this graphic and think in terms of foreign language education or practices. Teachers spend a lot of time developing their own materials. They may not consider them materials. Syllabi, lesson plans. Uh, in a couple of weeks, the University of Texas will start classes and I will be frantically putting together all kinds of course descriptions, materials, right? And each time I do this, whether I'm writing a quiz or a, an exam, I think, I know there are lots of people out there who are doing exactly the same thing. But we're all individuals watching television. Okay, so if we could do this game together, how powerful would that be? That's the idea of cognitive surplus, and I think that's the idea of open education. Okay, and as I said, all of these, all the links, all of the PowerPoints, everything we're sharing here today with you, PDFs, it will be on this website, The Power of Openness. So you don't need to take down all the URLs. It's all there for you.